The silviculture mini lecture will focus on quantifying growth and increment, uh, or how the volume in a forest changes over time. So let's start with some of the ecophysiological basis for growth that we need to understand first. This is a logistic growth curve. It can be used to fit many different uh, biological processes. This could be bacteria in a petri dish, but it also works well for forest trees where you have a lag phase early on towards the bottom left uh, of the graph there, where you can see you have slow growth over time. At some point in the middle of the curve, you run into exponential growth, where you have a rapid rate of growth in the population or the individual over time. And then finally, you get to this last phase where there's an asymptotic approach to that maximum limit on growth for a population this might be termed carrying capacity. Now, when we think about one forest tree, we have to think about how much carbon they can gain because that's gonna be what drives growth. Of course, trees gain carbon through photosynthesis, which means they're uptaking water from the soil, uh, they're gaining carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and then they're using light to convert those uh, into other chemicals, glucose, that they ultimately use to produce all their biomass. So as we look at a forest tree, depending on its shade tolerance, it can only carry so many live leaves uh, because eventually this hypothetical beam of light here penetrating through the canopy uh, gets more and more diffuse the lower the canopy it gets because light is being absorbed, absorbed or reflected uh, by leaves, twigs, branches, other canopy elements higher in the crown. And so what does the tree do with that? Well, you see all these dead branches at the bottom of the crown in this tree. And so you can think of each branch uh, as an analogy to a franchise um, in a business that has multiple locations. Well, if one of those locations is costing up more money to keep open than it's making, it doesn't make sense to have that location as part of the business. And so it gets closed down. Uh, the Arby's in Nagadocious would be one example. Uh, a tree works the same way. If this limb here is producing so little sugar through photosynthesis that it's costing the tree more sugar in respiration. Uh, so basically the sugar it takes to maintain its existing living tissues, it's not worth it for the tree to have that branch. And so that branch dies uh, naturally, the tree takes care of that. Um, and then it may self prune, it may fall off. Some trees are good self pruners, some trees are poor self pruners. So basically a canopy can only be so deep or the tree will shade out its lower limbs and a canopy can only get so wide. Uh, that depends on the density of the forest it's growing in, but that forest canopy, that tree, it can only have so wide a crown. And so there's a maximum limit to carbon in. You pack on the maximum leaf area you can fit on the tree, you get it as efficient as possible, and that caps out the amount of carbon that a tree can take in. At the same time, what you have to think about is all the living parts of that tree. So the foliage, the fine roots especially, but also parts of the coarser, large woody roots. And then every aspect of the tree in terms of the trunk, the branches, the coarse roots, the twigs, they all have this sheath of living tissue on them. The cork cambium, the vascular cambium, and in between them, the flow. And so those living tissues require sugar to fix their cellular machinery as it breaks down. So that's what we call maintenance respiration. So there's a carbon cost to maintaining living tissue. And so as a tree gets larger and larger and larger, it has more leaves, it has more roots, it has larger stems and larger limbs with more cambium, more phloem, and you get larger and larger and larger portions of living tissue that that tree has to keep alive. So again, we have the canopy bringing sugar in, we have live tissue using up that sugar. And so that's photosynthesis bringing sugar in, respiration, uh, losing carbon. And so the, the key aspect of that sugar is gonna be carbon. This is a carbon budget. And so eventually you have carbon gained and carbon lost here as a fraction. Well, if that fraction equals one, if all the carbon coming in through photosynthesis is lost to respiration to maintain the live tissues of that tree, there's no carbon left over for growth. And so as we look at this ecophysiological understanding of a tree, that's what dictates this maximum carrying capacity up here on the overall size of that tree and growth. So that's the ecophysiological basis of growth in forest trees. 
Next up, let's talk about different ways that we can measure growth. And I'm not talking about just measuring the height of the tree or the diameter of the tree, although those measurements will be important to calculate these numbers that we'll be looking at. Uh, but what we want to look at is three different ways we consider growth, and we call these increments because they're increments of growth between one time period and another time period. And so one thing we can look at is current annual increment. How many tons per acre did my forest produce in trees last year? Um, how many cubic feet per acre did my forest produce in trees last year? Current annual increment is good because it shows you what's actually happening relatively recently in that forest. The downside is that one year worth of growth may not reflect what's really going on in that forest. If you have a really severe drought in that year or if you conducted some sort of timber harvest in that year, that one year number may not be reflective of the overall stand. When we think about that logistic growth curve, we can also see this number is going to be lower early in a rotation in the lag phase as those small trees are slowly starting to add volume. And then later in a rotation, it's going to be smaller as the trees have reached nearly the carrying capacity for the site and they've maxed out that carbon balance in each tree. Whereas the current annual increment we expect to be higher in the middle of a rotation. Another option is periodic annual increment, and this is just a rolling average. So in any given year, what was the growth over the last five years average, or the last 10 years average? Uh, you can pick that term depending on what you need. This has many of the same pros and cons of current annual increment, but one added advantage is that if you just had uh, odd weather in the last year or a harvest operation or something like that in the last year where last year's growth wasn't very representative, it averages that out with several other years where you may have more representative growth. And finally, what I want to talk about and what we're going to be using mostly uh, is going to be mean annual increment. And so this is simply take the total growth over the whole life of the stand to this point, include anything that was removed through harvest and average it that out over the entire rotation. So the math here is very easy. Um, if your stand has grown to a certain volume or a certain weight, divide that by the age it took to get it to that point. Uh, you can see this concept and all these concepts are most going to be applicable to even aged forests. This is going to get more complex if we try to apply these concepts to uneven aged forests. So let's look at mean annual increment a little bit closer. One thing you need to decide is are you going to look at merchantable weight or volume only or are you going to look at total weight or volume? And both are correct. It just depends on what your situation is. If you're managing for timber and what you really care about is what's going on the log truck, then you need to look at that merchantable mean annual increment. If you're managing for carbon sequestration, wildlife aesthetics, some other objective, then total mean annual increment may make more sense in that scenario. And we know here a typical log truck in East Texas will carry 28.5 tons of wood. And so there are a bunch of different units we can use to calculate these different growth metrics when we're looking at mean annual increment. Commonly, we use weight now. Um, and in the US, we use tons, where a ton is 2,000 pounds. Sometimes you'll hear these referred to as short tons also. We use these units for a very good reason. Uh, this is what the mills are often using because they can weigh log trucks driving into the mill. And so it's a very efficient unit to utilize. I also just showed you that a log truck will typically carry in East Texas about 28 and a half tons of wood. That's for a few good reasons. One, the equipment will only carry so much weight, so you don't want to overload it because the loggers and the truckers could damage their equipment. But two, the, the main reason is heavy trucks will damage our roads. And because of this, we have different regulations in place at state and local government levels that dictate how heavy a truck going down the highway can be and how that weight can be distributed across the axles. And so in Texas, that's typically uh, the gross weight. So the truck plus the, the um, trailer plus all the logs, they can only weigh 80,000 pounds, okay? So 40 tons. Many loggers will buy a permit that allows them to go 5% over that. Uh, that with typical truck and trailer weights gets us to about that 28 and a half tons uh, in the actual load of wood itself. But if they exceed this weight, uh, there may be potential to damage our roads, but from the, the trucker and the loggers' perspectives, uh, they can get big tickets. And so they want to stay within that weight limit uh, so that they don't receive a large fine. So we very commonly use weight nowadays. Um, you could use this in metric tons in other parts of the world where a metric ton is a million grams. So that's going to be a thousand kilograms. 
we used to use volume very commonly, and so in some cases we still do use volume. Um, you'll see cubic feet used a lot. A hundred cubic feet is a unit we call a cunit. Um, and so you, you rarely see cunits referred to anymore, but if you see older literature, it just means 100 cubic feet. A cord is going to be 128 cubic feet of loose stacked wood. So a cord is often used with firewood, sometimes with pulp wood. Whereas a cubic foot is re referring to solid wood, a cord is referring to loose stacked wood bark on. So there's some differences in what they're actually referring to, even though they're all volume units. When you have high value saw timber, you often think of it in terms of board feet, where this is a board that's one inch thick and 12 by 12 inches in dimensions. So it's one square foot, one inch thick. So a board foot is not a cubic foot. There are 12 board feet in one cubic foot. And so a board foot is 144 cubic inches, 12 times 12 times one. If you have a thousand board feet, the abbreviation for that is MBF. That M does not mean a million. It means a thousand uh, as it would in Roman numerals. So if you see MBF, that's a thousand board feet. And then a, a lot of our international literature will use cubic feet of wood, uh, where that's 100 centimeters by 100 centimeters by 100 centimeters is one cubic meter. We often need to put these units on a per area basis. And so uh, in the US, we commonly use acres, where an acre is 10 square chains. Chain is 66 feet long. And so that means an acre is 43,560 square feet. Uh, internationally, you more commonly see hectares used where a hectare is 10,000 square meters. And so the conversion is uh, that there is one hectare per 2.47 acres. Now, when we look at converting these units, there's some handy conversions out there you wanna know. These are all approximate. They will differ depending on whether you're talking about pine, hardwoods, or other conifers. So keep in mind, these are ballpark numbers. They're great to use for a back of the envelope calculation, but if you need a really accurate estimate of weight in a timber cruise, there are gonna be some better conversion factors you're probably going to want to use. Uh, one good one to keep in mind is that three tons of wood is about 100 cubic feet of wood. Um, and so that's a very common conversion that I use. Uh, one quart of wood will be about 2.7 tons. So you can see a quart of wood is gonna be slightly less than 100 cubic feet of solid wood. And it's because of that airspace in there. Remember a quart is loose stacked wood. A thousand board feet is just over seven tons. A cubic meter and a ton of wood are about the same thing, so that's pretty handy. So you can see I'm trying to convert all these to tons because tons is what we use most commonly these days. And then, of course, if a ton is a cubic meter of wood, we know that there's a difference between an acre and a hectare. And so when you see these metric units used, they're almost always used with other metric units. So if you see that a stand has two and a half cubic meters per hectare of wood on it, that means it's about a ton per acre of wood. Um, one ton is equal to about 0.9 metric tons. And so again, if you had a ton per acre, that's equal to 2.2 metric tons per hectare because a hectare is larger than an acre. Okay, so we're gonna wanna interpret mean annual increment. So we get these numbers on mean annual increment, but what do they mean? So let's look at different forest cover types around the world. Let's look at typical mean annual increments of them. And I'll put all this in tons per acre per year so we can compare it directly to what we use here in the US South. I've converted most of these, most of these were reported in the literature as cubic meters per hectare. So depending on where you are in the world and how intensive your management is, eucalyptus may grow anywhere between two and 16 tons per acre per year. Um, those higher numbers are where it's managed as genetically improved eucalyptus, often clonal, in a plantation in countries such as Brazil, so planted outside its native range. The lower end of the range might be eucalyptus growing within its native Australia. Radiata pine, a pine native to California that's planted all over the Southern Hemisphere. In the Southern Hemisphere can be expected to produce between five and 13 tons per acre per year. Hybrid poplars commonly grown in the Pacific Northwest will yield between four and 15 tons per acre per year. Douglas fir, these numbers here are for Doug fir planted in Europe. And so it will yield four to six tons per acre per year planted in Northern Europe. Um, Doug fir within its native range within the Pacific Northwest could yield four to six tons per acre per year, but with good silviculture on good sites, you will get yields that are higher than that. Norway spruce in boreal forests in Northern Europe uh, will yield one to three tons per acre per year. And again, as you go really far north, uh, you start getting less growth because the growing season is going to be shorter. 
We'll see that again with white spruce in Canada or Russia. These are similar numbers for black spruce, yielding between one and three tons per acre per year. Most natural forests, not plantations, that are managed with low intensity throughout the world can be expected to yield less than one ton per acre per year. There will be local variation in that. So let's look at lava like pine plantations in the US South. And I'm going to use a little bit of a different framework to get us thinking about how to interpret mean annual increment. And so for lava Ali in the South, if you uh, see numbers around three tons per acre per year, what we would expect is that's a low quality site. Site index is low. Uh, you have a low intensity of silviculture. You're not using a lot of herbicides. You're not using a lot of fertilizers. That's a pretty low level of productivity. So if we carried that out over an average 25 year rotation, that plantation would only yield you 2.6 truckloads of wood per acre. Um, these mean annual increments I'm showing you are focused on merchantable, not total volume. Okay, if you double that to six tons per acre per year, that's an average quality site in the south with operational silviculture. Normal establishment applications of woody and herbaceous herbicides, and then decent management mid-rotation, good thinning, maybe some fertilizer applied mid-rotation. And that'll yield us about five truckloads of wood over 25 year rotation. So our southwide average is probably four to six loads of wood per acre. This is kind of right in the middle of that. So think about six tons per acre per year as a very average mean annual increment. Nine tons per acre per year is achievable in lava like pine in the US South, but that means you're on a really good site, high site index, you have good soils, good climate in that area, um, and you're probably using very intensive silviculture. To achieve these numbers, you're gonna need really good uh, competition control with herbicides, you're gonna need fertilizer application, you're gonna need a good thinning regime, you're gonna need good mechanical site prep, to fix any potential problems with the soil. So this is very high level of silvicultural intensity. But that high level inv investment and in intensity can pay off. You may be bringing in more than eight truckloads of wood on an acre of land in a 25 year rotation. And again, with all these, I'm comparing them at the same 25 year rotation length, but on that lower productivity site, you might be on a longer rotation if you're only growing three tons per acre per year. And if you're growing nine tons per acre per year, you might be able to shorten this rotation down to 20 years or even less. The final one I'll show you here is 12 tons per acre per year. We may have a rare stand or two here and there where just everything is exceptional that may be pulling this in, but really this is more a goal than something we're achieving in the South with our lava olive pine plantations. So if we continue our efforts in tree breeding to improve the growth of our pines, um, and we continue learning about silviculture and deploying intensive silvicultural systems. You know, th this is a goal that we could achieve in many places in the US South in the coming decades. And that would bring in 10 and a half truckloads per acre, but likely you would be on much less than a 25 year rotation. And so the take home message, mean annual increment is gonna be a very useful concept in silviculture. We saw there's a lot of units that can, can cause a lot of confusion. Um, and so the thing that I typically do that's most helpful is I convert everything to tons per acre. And that's what we think of most in the South. Of course, other parts of the country, other parts of the world, you're used to working with different units. So do whatever makes sense locally. And then uh, you've now seen a bunch of benchmarks. So if, if you're doing a modeling exercise and you get an output that's a certain number of tons per acre per year, the question is always, is that good? Especially with a student first learning silviculture. Well, now you have some things you can compare it with to make a decision on whether that's good or not. Now, whether it's good or not, keep in mind, you know, if you have a low quality site and it's low quality because there are problems with that site you can't fix. So if you have a very deep sand where water may be pretty limiting, it's very difficult to fix that with silviculture. It's very difficult to fix that with genetics. So you're never going to be considering getting that site up to a really high MAI. You need to be aware you'll be at a lower MAI and managing that standard to lower MAI. So that's a little bit on growth and increment. Uh, this wasn't everything, but hopefully enough to get you started.